This meeting is being recorded. That was weird. We're ready to go? <laughs> Good. Heavenly Father, bless our time, we pray, as we open your word, enlighten us, we ask. Amen. 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 Well, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Thank you for coming. And um, uh, I hope you're uh, hungry for God's word. I am. It says in Psalm 119, your, thy word is a lamp to our feet. Thy, thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So uh, how much is that true in these days? In darkness, we have God's word that is guiding us. And, um, and uh, you know, especially in time prophecy, a lot of people are talking about that, that, you know, that like a jigsaw puzzle, the pieces at one minute, they're kind of coming together. The next minute, it's like not so clear. And then something happens. Russia, Iran, China are, are on the scene. All of a sudden, the, that jigsaw puzzle starts to take shape. Because we know that the nations are going to come against us here. Um, and uh, there's going to be troubles. So uh, this is all about us preparing for troubles. And, um, you know, a lot of people here in Israel and all around the world, and this happened in COVID as well, doesn't necessarily need to be a war. When, like the story of Job, Job had a fence of protection around him. Everything was relatively good. Satan said to the Lord, take that fence away and let's see what kind of a guy he really is. And the Lord said, okay. So that fence of protection was taken away. And we have, we've all got our lives, our work, our job, our schedules. Our, it's when those things are touched upon, when our finances, when our health, when our relationships, whatever it may be, gets touched, then all of a sudden it's like, wow, God, where are you? What is happening? And our faith is really put to the test. And in the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord gave an illustration about the wise man building his house upon the rock. That rock, everyone, in my estimation, is God's word and the Lord himself synonymous with each other god's word spoken word and himself because in the book of isaiah chapter 2 and in the book of micah it says in that day the last utopian days every man will sit under his own vine and under his own fig tree you know that verse everyone every man will sit under, sit under his own vine and under his own fig tree and it's a picture of someone being content. That was the place, by the way, in the second temple period, that disciples of rabbis, they would sit and they would meditate on God's word. And that's all they needed, a quiet place and God's word to meditate on a day and night. And I know that sounds simplistic, but I don't know about you uh, seniors among us, but the older I get, that seems to be the more and more uh, prioritized and important thing in life. Because as you get older, you, your values change. You know, when you're younger, you're, you're trying to find who you are. You're trying to find your vocation, your place in life. Not saying you don't try to struggle with that when you get older. But, um, but the, the things of the world, they become less and less important. Uh, and then eternity and um, and uh, and just that sense of and of course, looking after your health, health becomes a, a major priority. But sitting under that picture of sitting under every man sitting under his own vine and under his own fig tree, a place studying God's word, meditating on his word day and night. I actually think remember when the Lord came to Nathaniel in, in John one. And uh, and uh, Nathaniel said, you know, how do you know me? And the Lord said, he said, before I knew you, you were sitting under the, the, the I think it's the fig tree. 
And so it's, it's actually believed that he was doing that. He was studying his scriptures um, and uh, doing what a typical disciple did in those days. Anyhow, um, today we are studying Leviticus 21. And our, uh, our, the name of our uh, parasha is called Emor, which is the Hebrew word, speak. And it's from Leviticus 21.1, when the Lord said to Moses, speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say to them, speak to the priests. Now, once again, I want to just bring us into context. What is going on? It is the context of God's tabernacle. God's tabernacle that has been built. And what is the tabernacle, everyone? Well, some people say it's a it's a it's an earthly picture of what it's like in the heavens. God's house with chambers and a and a and uh the the Shekinah the glory of God right in the heart of the house where God speaks to his people between the mercy seat or over the mercy seat between the cherubim. And that's the idea of it being on earth. And the book of Leviticus begins with God inviting us to come in to that house. Beautiful picture. And that concept of him inviting us into his house is a reverse of what happened in the Garden of Eden when man was sent out of the garden. Because why? Because he he entered into a space of God that he shouldn't have. God said, you can be anywhere you want in the garden. You can eat from any tree, tree of life as well. Just one place. I don't want you to go. And of course, man violated that. He went into that space. So he was sent out. And this invitation to come into his house is, is part of our life's journey. The call every day, every moment, to come and, and have communion and fellowship with God. But there's a way to come in. And the way is through what? Paying your church fees every year. No. The way of coming in is good works. No. It is through sacrifice. The sacrificial system and the priests. Okay, now, I hope that doesn't scare you, because when I use those terms, sacrifices, priests, some of you may have been brought up and with terribly bad experiences uh, with those words, priests. It, it, may, it may bring up echoes of religion and fear and walking on ice. Well, that's not how it is in the scriptures here. It's the total opposite. It's God's provision for his people, the people of Israel, to come in and commune with him. So, uh, and then lastly, before we go into the text, something had just happened. Aaron's two sons, uh, Pinchas, and, no, not Pinchas and Hophni, um, Avihu and Magog. Uh, it's just got a brain freeze. His two sons, they offered up a sacrifice that was unauthorized. Okay? And what happened? Fire came out from the Lord and smote them, and they, they died. And this was on the inauguration of Aaron to be the high priest. His sons were struck, and, um, you know, can you imagine? And I we talked about this a few weeks ago. Uh, the high, probably the highlight of Aaron's life, being ordained to be the high priest. And at that inauguration, his two sons were struck. Um, but Aaron held his peace. Nadab and Abihu, brother. Say that again. Nadab and Abihu. Nadab and Abihu. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Appreciate that. Uh, yes, so he held his peace. Why? Because Moses said why they were struck. Because they did not act reverently, and it's probable that they were drunk. Because straight after, God says, when you draw near, you are not to touch alcohol. You're not to get drunk. 
So that is the context of what's going on. And last week we talked about Kiddushin, which is holiness. And this is where we're really getting into a big theme of the book of Le Leviticus, holiness. And I talked about how every aspect of life as a priest was whole was, was, was the goal was to be holy why you can look at it two ways you can look at it because god wants me to walk on ice and live a uh uh uh, uh, uh holier than thou life or you can look at it in a, a different way by walking in holiness not only will you experience the lord but it will transform your life it's part of our transformation, walking in holiness. For example, let's just say, I don't know, let's, for an example, just say you're a very um, insecure person with money. That's a nice way of saying you're very tight and stingy with money, okay? Usually people are when they're insecure. And, um, and let's say you start to change your way and you start to be generous you start to be more giving and i'm not talking about st stupidly giving i'm talking about with wisdom do you know what it's going to do it's not only going to bless other people the blessing is going to come on you because it's going to lift you to a spiritually different realm because you're touching into the heart of god he's a generous god he's a wise god he's a caring god OK, so by walking and keeping God's commands and walking in holiness, it actually part of the reason is it transforms our lives. Now, in Leviticus 21, 1, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron and say to them. Now, this is a command from Moses. Sorry, the Lord said to Moses. Now, once again, Moses is this mediator. He's the man that God speaks through. And whatever Moses is told to do, he does it. Sometimes Moses is commanded to speak to Aaron. Sometimes he's commanded to speak to other. But it's a picture. Just want to give you that picture of a mediator. Okay. So, um, and, and that's a key important, another key important theme in the book of Leviticus. A mediator, or another word, is a priest. A priest, a vicar, and I've mentioned this a number of times, the word vicar is the root word of vicarious. The word vicarious means on behalf of. So that's the role of a mediator, a priest, a vicar, a reverend, to uh, go to the people on behalf of the Lord. Now, this week's uh, portion is a, a, a big theme is on the word death. Death. And the strictness of not touching death. Not coming in contact with the dead. Not uh, walking among the dead. Anything that is associated with death makes you unclean or uh or the or having the need to be purified none of the priests should touch a dead body or even assist at his funeral or eat at the funeral feast they've gotten they're to have nothing to do with it they were to be serviceable upon all occasions and for the handling of holy thing so their goal is to reach for life and why i think this is important we're going to break it down is you and i are surrounded by things in this world and in our lives that cause death and i don't mean physical death i mean spiritual death many many things and i'm going to give a few examples very soon and uh uh, so, but the priest's call to walk in holiness 
is to protect themselves from that and just speak life, look for life, uh, and for the things that are holy. This is actually taken from Numbers chapter 19, which says, the one who touches the corpse of any person shall be unclean for seven days. And just as a matter of interest, it wasn't just the Israelites. This was in common in the Egyptian world and in the Greek world. Egyptian priests were, were uh, the same among burials and graves. And the Romans also uh, were very, very strict in this uh, light. So where we're talking about everyone, and this is the theme today, holiness unto the Lord. Last week was holiness, but this is holiness unto the Lord. In other words, you and I, we are at a level of spirituality where we are today. We're walking in a level of holiness today. And simply, we want to raise the bar. We want to get closer to God. That's the whole, the, the, the tabernacle. You've got an outer court. You've got a holy place. And you've got a holy of holies. Only the high priest could go in the holy holies. Only the priests could go among the holy place, the common people, the Gentiles, the women. There were different courts, okay? And where the book of Hebrews says, you know, we can have boldness to come into the holy of holies. Yeah, that's a faith issue, you and I. We, we can do that by faith. But I'm talking about, you know, from the heart issue here, the heart issue the level of depth that we are walking in. Uh, and as I said, we will break that down. Now, before we go into it, let me ask, and we, we did talk about this maybe about six months ago, because in, in Christianity, in Judaism, even in Islam, there is a conflict between what I think we would call being in the world, but being not of the world. In other words, there are some ancient rabbis who say we should not enjoy the blessings of this world, or they don't use the word blessings. We should not enjoy the things of this world. We should be in a constant state of uh, humility. Uh, we should. That's why, by the way, Orthodox, ultra Orthodox Jews wear black. Number one, it doesn't. Uh, it, it, it's it's a modest. They're not a, drawing attention to themselves. And number two, it's symbolic of mourning. Okay, Until the Mashiach comes and brings in a utopian world, we are in a state of mourning. Because as Paul says in Romans 1, the whole earth, it, 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 whole creation is groaning until redemption. So this, there's that side of the pendulum. And then there's other rabbis, ancient great rabbis, sages, who said, no, 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 no. Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He gave it to us. And in, in the story of creation, he said to Adam, be fruitful, multiply, have dominion, enjoy. So we are actually to not become idolatrous with the things of the world, but to enjoy things. So that's something that you and I, uh, we're, we're working out as part of our, our, our walk. But. Remember the theme, holiness, because some things, and remember I talked about death, some things cause, some good things in the world cause death. Good example, a nice piece of chocolate cake, okay? You start off eating it, those first few mouthfuls, you're in heaven, you're enjoying it. You, you're still in that state of heaven when you're halfway, you know it's a big piece. You know you shouldn't eat the whole cake, but you do anyway because you want your cake and eat it too. And by the end, how do you feel? You feel dead. You feel terrible. You feel, why did I do that? Stupid. So that's a, a, a tiny little example of our wrestle in this world with the things of the world and our discipline with it because... As I said, every little thing. Do, do you know that feeling when you do have that self-control to say no? What a great feeling it is. What a great feeling. 
It's that sense of control. You're, you're, you've controlled yourself. And uh, uh, this is part of walking in holiness. You may think that that word holiness is a bit too strong for little illustrations like this. And maybe it is in some cases, but maybe not. Maybe this is, see, see the, this is what being a disciple is all about. This is what walking in this world is all about. Keeping our peace, keeping away from the things that uh, cause death or, or steal our peace. And don't forget <clears throat> that Paul uses our body as an example of a temple. So, you know, maybe Paul's being too strict about it by using that example. So if, you, if you've got struggles with what I'm saying, take it up with Paul. In any event, uh, we are called to this higher call of holiness. And, um, and of course, part of that is discipline. But it's that wrestle. How much joy, uh, you know, how much or, or no joy. Enjoy the world. Or not? Should I become, uh, should I join a monastery or should I assimilate? And if I do assimilate, how much should I assimilate? Because historically, assimilation can be dangerous. And yet, on the other hand, who did the Lord hang out with, everyone? Did he hang out with the religious people? Not really. He hung out with the prostitutes, with the sinners, with the tax collectors with the lame, with the blind, with the outcasts. So that's a really interesting concept. So um, we're going to look at some practical things that do defile, that do cause spiritual death. But before I do, let's go back to the sacrifices. The, remember, the word for sacrifice, we're at the bottom of page one. Remember, everyone, the word for sacrifice is the word korban, and it's the root word of the word for drawing near to God, kreva, or lehit karev. And so that's the whole idea of bringing a sacrifice. It allows you to draw near to God. However, I want to bring a, 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 a facet to you about bringing a sacrifice. In our passage this week, in Leviticus 21, verse 6 and verse 8, Bringing a sacrifice is looked upon as bringing God a meal. Look at verse 6. Because they present the food offerings to the Lord, the food for their God. They are to be holy. Verse 8. Regard them as holy because they offer up the food of your God. So even in the ancient Near Eastern religions, other religions, they are looked upon as food for the gods. So you bring the food, you burn it on the altar, or you leave it there, and that smell is supposed to go up and be a nice a stench in God, or not stench, a nice smell in God's nostrils, and that he would, be accept, he would accept it and be happy. Same with a drink offering. There are drink offerings in the Bible. You're quenching God's thirst. These are man-made terms. Or not man-made, they are God-made, but these are human terms used to try and give a picture of uh, what is pleasing unto the Lord. So break that down, everyone. When you walk in holiness, when you do a holy, sacred thing, that's like food for God. Because we don't have a temple anymore. We don't have a temple. We're not offering sacrifices. But we are sacrificing. When you, when you dedicate your life on a daily basis or whenever you do, when you pray, when you come to the altar, your little prayer room, you're saying, God, I offer this day. I offer my life afresh. That's like food to God. He's happy with that. He's pleased with that. That's why when Paul said, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. And I wonder when Paul used that term, whenever you eat, whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, I wonder whether he was thinking of the priests in the temple who were eating and drinking as a devotion to God. 
because part of their priestly service, they had to eat some of the sacrifices. So think about that concept, everyone. Sacrifice as food to God. When, you, when you're standing at the door of a church, greeting people, that's a service to the Lord and to the people. That's like food to God. If you, if you look at it with different eyes, and when you're, now, 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 let me just pause because I had a really interesting conversation yesterday. Oh my gosh. I had a conversation with someone that is so left wing secular Jewish. He's a lawyer and he's a very renowned uh, lawyer, ge a genius of a man. He couldn't, you could not find a more left-wing liberal Jew if you tried. Uh, some of the things that came out of the mouth, for, you know, I, I talked about the book of Joshua. You know what he said? He said, I hate that Joshua. He's a fascist. That's what he said. He said when Joshua came into this land, wiping out women, wiping out children, who the hell does, did he think he was? This kind of rhetoric. I hate him. And so we got onto this topic of sacrifice, of the difference between sacrifice and what was the word he used? Just giving, just giving. And we, we, gave, we talked about examples uh, in a marriage or, or parents with children. He said, we should never sacrifice. We should never use that word sacrifice. When you give, you give because you want to give and because it's from a heart of love. Now, and, it, and he even talked about how he hates Christians and he hates Christianity because the Messiah of the Christians is a Messiah who offered himself as a sacrifice. He hated the concept of sacrifice. And the, how we got onto this topic is because um, the right-wingers, which is he's the complete opposite, um, when a Jew dies, if you're, a, if you're a religious Jew, quite often at funerals, the rabbis will eulogize you by saying, These, this man or this woman, they uh, gave their lives for our nation. They are fighting on the front line for our nation. They sacrifice their lives. So that word sacrifice, and, and for him, he hates it. And he said, I've been to some of these funerals. And but but he's he's an extreme case. But it did make me start to think a lot about, you know, uh, what is the place of sacrifice in our lives? You know, of course there's no there's no sacrifices in the there's no temple, but are we called to sacrifice? I talked about this a couple of weeks ago, that when the priests took the sacrifices into the temple, God told them how to do it, when to do it, what portions that they have to offer, and what portions they can keep. He broke it down. And one of the points that I mentioned, which is one of many lessons we can learn from that, is it, it, apart from uh, uh, enabling us to draw near to God, it was to teach us the concept of sacrifice in life. That when you and I are called upon to sacrifice our time, our money, our lives, when we see how the priest did it, or, or rather when the priest did it, they learned a lot as they did it. They learned a lot about this concept of sacrifice. They became wise and discipline as they went about their lives of offering up sacrifices. Because you and I, we're called upon all the time, to some degree or another, if it's not to sacrifice, well, it's, it's at least to give. Because there's so many needs in the world. And like the Lord said, freely you've received, freely give. So again, it leads us to the question, um, our giving, is it a sacrifice? Or is it simply just giving? Or is it a bit of both? Does it overlap? Or maybe there's a bit of both. Something to, to think about. And if it is a sacrifice, should we do it even if we don't like it? Because God loves a cheerful giver. Because his argument, actually, one of his arguments, is that if you do it 
when you don't want to do it, it can lead to contempt. It can lead to bitterness. It can lead to resentment. This was one of his uh, uh, arguments. Now, take that over to our lives as followers of God. What about some left-wingers or even right-wingers who have lost children or lost parents fighting for the land here? Are they resentful? Are they bitter? Are they angry? Well, maybe they take their anger out on the government. Maybe. I don't know. It's a big topic. Maybe we can talk about it later on. But whatever we do, whether we eat or drink, we're to do it unto the Lord as a uh, as an expression of our devotion to the Lord. And in the Lord's eyes, it's food. It's like we're serving him a meal. We are quenching his thirst. We are pleasing his appetite. And don't forget, it's part of what transforms our lives. And I brought this up, by the way, to this lawyer. He didn't like that. He didn't like that because he... he he doesn't really believe in a God, and therefore he's not really accountable. He doesn't need to be transformed. He just wants to uh, live and let live. Nice guy, but he doesn't want to be accountable. <laughs> but this is our calling, everyone. Be ye holy, for I, the Lord your God, are holy. Page two, the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, for the generations to come, including that lawyer, None of your descendants who has a defect may come near to offer the food of his God. No man who has any defect may come near. No man who is blind or lame, disfigured or deformed. No man with a crippled foot or hand, or who is a hunchback or a dwarf, or who has an eye defect or has a festering of running sores or damaged testicles. No descendant of Aaron the priest who has any defect is to come near to present the food offerings to the Lord. He has a defect. He must not come near to offer the food of his God. He may eat the most holy food of his God as well as the holy food, yet because of his defect, he must not go near the curtain of approach to the altar and so desecrate my sanctuary. I am the Lord who makes him holy. Now, some people think, they read this passage and they think, well, who can come near to God? Some, you know, but most uh, commentators would say that God is basically just showing that there's a standard, there's a standard here for the high priest. This is speaking about the high priest. And um, so it's something that we should strive toward. It's kind of almost like, remember what happened in the early church when Ananias and Sapphira held back the money? What happened? God struck them. Okay? Now, does God go around striking every person that sins in the church? No. But the commentators say that God was setting a, 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 a standard in the early church that he wanted the fear to God, fear of God to fall on the church. And, um, and of course, by them uh, uh, sinning and by them being struck uh, dead, that was an example of God's, you know, God's call in our lives. So it's not something I believe that we should... Uh, of fear, but it is something that we should strive towards. And then, and I want to give an example of what I'm trying to say because I don't want it to be misunderstood. There was a video I was watching. Uh, it was a transgender uh, group of students at a university. And a Christian man was invited to speak. Uh, and so there were Christians and non-Christians there. And this is what the man said. He said, if you are struggling with your gender identity, he said, if you're a non-believer and you don't read the Bible, he said, basically, in that case, you do what you want. You've got no accountability. You do what you want. But he said, if you're a Christian and you follow the Bible as much as you can and you struggle with these issues, and by the way, you'd be surprised how many people in the church these days are really struggling with that gender identity. But he said, if you're struggling with that, you need to look at what the Bible says. The Bible says, male and female, he created them. So he said, that's what you need to keep looking at and running toward. But he said, if you struggle with that, 
there is a safety net of grace, if you fall, if you're struggling, as long as you get back up and keep moving towards what the scripture says is your true identity, male and female. So what he was saying, he wasn't giving a license to sin. He was basically saying, here's the, the mirror. You got to keep going towards the mirror. That's the, the holiness, Ma our, our male or female uh, gender identity. But if you do struggle, if you do fall, there is grace there. But get up and move on. And that's what I'm trying to say, everyone. We are called to walk a life of holiness. We got to keep moving, keep climbing the ladder. Um, but there, of course, there is a safety net of grace. One John says, uh, uh, if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. And if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Micah chapter 1 verse 8 says, when you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice lame or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you? says the Lord Almighty. So Malachi and the scriptures, really, they're trying to get to the heart. They're trying to dig deeper. See, this is a, another part of our transformation when we start to really search our motives. And that's why I'm talking about the difference between giving and sacrificing. And when we do give or sacrifice, are we pleased about it? Do we really want to? Is that what God's call, calling me to do? Uh, because we can we can sacrifice, but really we can have a, a stink attitude about it. But even if we do, maybe it's the right thing to do. I don't know. So, uh, but in this case, uh, Malachi was challenging the priests, saying that they were offering up defected sacrifice. These are called unacceptable sacrifices, and we talked about that with Nadav and Avihu the two sons of Aaron, who offered up unwarranted sacrifices. They were drunk. They were out of their minds. They were not in their right minds when they sacrificed. And in verse 17 of uh, Leviticus 21, speak to Aaron and his sons and to the Israelites and say to them, if any of you, whether an Israelite or a foreigner residing in Israel, that's you, Gentiles, foreigner, presents a gift for a burnt offering to the Lord, either to fulfill a vow or as a free will offering. That's, that's that given, the free will. You must present a male without defect from the cattle, sheep or goats, in order that it may be accepted on your behalf. Do not bring anything with a defect because it will not be accepted on your behalf. When anyone brings from the herd or flock a fellowship offering to the Lord to fulfill a special vow or a free will offering, it must be without defect or blemish to be acceptable. Do not offer to the Lord the blind, injured, or maimed, or anything with warts, or festering, or running sores. Do not place any of these on the altar as a food offering presented to the Lord. And in other words, everyone, it's better not to sacrifice. Better. If you've got an attitude, don't do it. It's like the parable of the two sons. Remember the Lord gave a parable. He said a man had two sons. And the father said to them, go and uh, go work in the field. One said, yeah, okay, I'll do it. And he didn't do it. Outwardly, he looked like the real holy religious son. Yeah, I'll, I'll go and do it. And he didn't do it. The other son, he had an attitude. He said, no. But later he did it. And maybe that second son, he thought about it, and he dealt with his bad attitude. And then when he did it, it was with the right attitude. So that's what we're talking about. Like Cain and Abel, remember that they both brought sacrifices. And the Lord was happy with Abel's, but he wasn't happy with Cain's. And uh, and uh, Cain didn't like it, and he killed his brother, um, uh, you know, simply because he wasn't able. So uh, then um, remember Peter. Remember when Peter, and I don't know if this is a good example, 
Remember the Lord said, I'm going to go, I, I need to go up to Jerusalem. I'll be handed over to the authorities and be crucified. What did Peter do? He took the Lord aside and he said, Lord, far be it that you should go up. No, Lord, don't go up. Now, I guarantee that Peter had good, good motives. He wanted to protect the Lord. He, or, or maybe he didn't have good motives. Maybe he wanted to prove to the Lord, you know, um, you know, I'm going to take care of you, Lord. Uh, no, I don't want you to go. I'm going to protect. I don't know what his true motives were. But what did the Lord respond? He said, get behind me, Satan. You do not have the things of God in mind, but the things of man. So motives, purity, holiness, or was it out of a weakness? This is a tough one. This is a tough one. It's like when some people do, you, you know, for, you know, let's say a parent. A parent is over-loving, over-protective, and you as the child, or even a teacher, you turn around to that parent and you say, hey, listen, you're out of line. You, you're, you're stepping into a zone, into a space that's not yours to step into. And that parent is hurt, but my motives are right. I love my child. I only want the best for them. But it's actually not wise to do that. So, uh, obviously, Peter, his act of, you know, a, as a disciple may have had some nice sentiments and emotion, but in the Lord's eyes, uh, he was off. He was in the wrong space. And again, this is what we're learning as disciples in our sacrifice, in our walk, in our discipleship, like the priests were told when, how, what to sacrifice. That's what you and I are learning as we're growing in wisdom, as we're growing in our understanding. And, and, and let me remind us that in the tabernacle, all these different sacrifices, when, how, what, it is to, to, to transform our lives. There was a verse I quoted last week where Moses said, for this is your wisdom and understanding as we grow in these areas it's as if we're going back to the garden of eden and i'll once again use that illustration we were thrown out of the garden of eden or adam was because he stepped into a space that wasn't his so our walk in holiness is actually a call to come back to god's space in the garden of eden the tree of life. And so all of our lives, that I believe, that's what uh, our, our challenge is, to come back into that place slowly, slowly. And it's a process of learning how to get back into that holy of holies. And, and every so often we get that experience, right? We're in a church. Or we do something extraordinary that we're not called upon to do every day. We like feel we feel like wow. I think I really touch the heart of the Father. I think I really, uh, you know, hit a home run with that one, so to speak. And by the way, I'm not talking about earning God's love here, everyone. There's a big difference. I'm not talking about earning God's love. I think what we need to have as a foundation, we need to know that we already are accepted in the beloved, that we already have his unconditional love, okay? And if, you, if you're not at that place, you've got to work on that. You've got to work. That's why Paul prayed for the churches, that our eyes would uh, be enlightened to the, the height, the depth, the breadth, the width of his love for us. We've got to, Start everything from that foundation that we are loved. And it doesn't depend on what we do or what we don't do. But as we walk out our walk and in, 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 uh, climbing higher spiritual uh, life, I think it's like we're coming back into Eden. We're coming back to that tree of life so that we can enjoy that intimacy and communion. It's not to get an, another medal on our chest. 
or to make ourselves look better in the church and for us to look at our neighbor and say, I'm at a higher spiritual uh, uh, level than you. It's, that's nothing. That's self-righteousness. It's not about that. It's about our enjoying God, our communion with him. And like I started off, sitting under our own vine and sitting under our own fig tree, that place of sweet communion with the Lord. So having that picture of coming back into the Garden of Eden, I always like to go back to that. And the ancient rabbis talk a lot about that. This is part of God's redemption plan for our lives. And don't forget, it's not just a matter of doing it for religious sake. It's number one, it pleases God. It's food for him. And number two, it's food for us. And it transforms our lives. Because here's the problem. When we're not walking in that line, you know what we're doing? We're feeding from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We're not aiming towards the tree of life, which is God's word, which is which is his wisdom, the life of the spirit. Paul talks about this in Romans 7, the life of the spirit. We're not walking in that path. We're actually feeding from the tree of knowledge. And what did God say? The day you eat from that tree, you will die. And see, that's what our text today is all about. The priests who are called to, to, to be holy and pure and keep away from the dead. Do not be defiled from death. Do you know you and I, we can be defiled by our negative thinking. Because we're, if we're not feeding on the tree of uh, life, we're feeding from the tree of knowledge, which tastes good. Remember, they taste, they took from that fruit because it tastes good, it looked good, and it made you wise. They wanted to be like God. This is the danger. But as a result of eating from that tree of knowledge, look at the fruit of that tree, everyone. Firstly, they, they saw their nakedness. They felt vulnerable. They didn't feel secure with the covering of the Lord. So they felt naked. They felt afraid. Adam, where are you? He was hiding. Fear came in, hiding behind the fig leaves. Then the blame game. Then their minds got screwed up. He made me do it. She made me do it. The devil made blame game, not taking responsibility and then jealous and all and that that was the next generation cain and abel abel uh cain was jealous so it opened up a whole ugly evil world of death 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 that's when death came into the world so we got to keep looking for the tree of life being uh, uh um uh and being transformed so some of the things that the Israelites were commanded in these uh, uh, laws, in the Torah, that would protect them from walking in the line of death, of uh, uh, defilement, was they were told when they come into the land, not to be conformed like the other nations. Don't be like the nations. And you know what? That's how you and I become defiled. That's where we, that it takes us away from that walk of holiness. We, 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 you know, we're out on a limb. We're walking this walk of holiness and we see other people, they're happy. And let's be honest. One thing the Lord said about being a disciple, he said, we've got to deny ourselves. Maybe I should have said that to this lawyer yesterday. Part of our lives as disciples, is denying ourselves. Actually, he would have hated that. That really would have upset him. He would have said, you know, he said, he, he probably would have, you know, said that's exactly the example of what I'm talking about. But uh, that's part of the, the Lord's call. Deny our fleshly. See, it needs to be defined. What did he mean to deny ourselves? to deny our fleshly, our, our carnal self, our, our, our bias self, that 
evil inclination that we have in us and choose uh, life. That's what Moses kept saying. I said before you, life and death, uh, 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 blessing and curse, choose life, choose life. So not being conformed or actually, can we be conformed to the ways of the world? I think there's some times that it's not necessarily sin. That's something that we all on an individual basis have to work out. You know, there's times that Paul took upon him his heavenly identity, but there were other times he said, I'm a Roman, I'm a Jew. So he used worldly principles. And this is, again, where we need wisdom. We need the Holy Spirit to help us. Uh, uh, looking at others and want to conform with others can be a trap. And in verse 5 of Leviticus uh, 21, look at what it says. Priests must, must not shave their heads or shave the edges of their beards or cut their bodies. By the way, that's the reason why we, we, uh, we wear ringlets on, on the sides. Pay off their call. Because that was a cultic Canaanite pagan practice. So God is saying, no, you're not to do that. And then in verse 10, it says, the high priest, the one among his brothers who has had the anointing oil poured upon his head and has been ordained to wear the priestly garments, must not let his hair become unkempt or tear his clothes. He's not allowed to turn up to work with a bad hair. He's not allowed to have a bad hair day. That's basically what Moses is saying. So what's going on? What is a bad hair day symbolize? Why does, why does it say a priest is not allowed to turn up with his hair unkempt? Again, it's, that I, it's the reason why Aaron's two sons died. They were drunk. And they went in out of their minds. They did not respect the sacredness. Be holy as I am holy, says the Lord. Okay? So it's, it's, it's a sign of respecting God, not just turning up in our pajamas. And, I, and, I, and guys, there's a balance here because on one hand, we sing that song, just as I am, you know, just as I am. Uh, and God does accept us just as I am, but he doesn't want us to stay just as I am. He wants us, you know, to be transformed. To be, do you know I told I taught this? Do you know one of the sacrifices that the Canaanites offered? Excuse me if you're eating breakfast, everyone. Okay, what I'm going to tell you. One of the sacrifices that the Canaanites offered, they would defecate. They would do a number two on their altars. Why? Why? I'll tell you why. Because it's as if that, and 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 I'm, we're all adults here. Basically, it's it's just processed food. It's just processed food it goes through your body, and in fact, a lot of the food you and I eat is actually uh, grown from processed food, manure, which is uh, fertilizer. In any event, back online, um, the idea when you did that on the altar, is you were basically saying, God, I'm, uh, uh, I'm, I'm defecating, and thank you that you accept everything about me, even the horrible, smelly, ugly part of me. You accept it. This is the food. This is the Canaanite thinking. So like I apologize before, I apologize again if you're eating your breakfast, but that was one of the sacrifices. But Going back to the here, there, of course, God accepts us as we are, but he doesn't want us to stay as we are. So a, a simple sign is we, we come out here. We, 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 you know, we present ourselves before God. That's why the priestly garments were so strict. But there's something else here, everyone. And it's this. So that, and remember I keep saying that walking in holiness is not just for God, it's for you as well. 
The other reason why you're not allowed to have unkempt hair is so that you will grow in self-respect. You yourself will grow in self-respect. You will appreciate more and more God's handiwork. You are God's handiwork. The priest is God's handiwork. And as a result, I need to look after myself as much as I can, to the best I can, without going overboard, without, you know, going out and buying, you know, $50,000 watches and things like that. Or, or the, or, or, although if you're doing that, I, I don't want to judge you, okay? Because uh, I do know a, a believer who does that. But anyhow, um, in, within proportion, we need that self-respect. And I want to emphasize this because, friends, maybe you don't struggle with that. But do you know when people, when people fall into depression, when some people who are elderly and senior, all their kids have moved out of home, a lot of their friends have died, they fall into depression. They sit at home. No one comes to visit them. So why should I comb my hair? Why should I have a shower? They can go days without showering. And Olivia, I know your job, you probably uh, deal with people like this as a, as a, in, a in a nursing home. Uh, and, and I'm, I'm going to put my uh, hand up uh, during this war. There's been days that I've started to feel myself fall into that uh, path of depression. So it's something that we need to be aware of, not allow that to creep in. It's, it's a death that we may not even realize we're in. It's a slumber. And it's where, it, 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 you know, I don't want to use the word holy or unholy. It's simply a slumber. And we need to shake out of that. Um, I remember years ago, I was looking for an apartment and a friend of mine, he said, listen, I've got a spare room in my house. Uh, you can rent it from me. So I, I packed all my stuff in the car, went over. I started to go and when I got into his house, I, I didn't check out his house before. I just trusted it was, you know, it was going to be okay. He was one of these guys who um, he was, and he told me after, he was he was in total depression. His house was a mess. It was smelly. He didn't look after himself. And uh, after about two days, I all that stuff that I unpacked, I packed it back up. I put it back in my car and I was out of there. And he actually, he said, I think it would be best for both of us. Because the moment that he, I moved in, he freaked out. I was in his space. But anyhow, um, I think the point is being made. Uh, uh, and maybe there's other reasons why the priest was not to have unkempt hair as well. And if any of you guys have some insights, please feel free to share that. Then there's the issue. So, so by the way, just to emphasize that point, respect for God and self-respect. We've got to grow. We've got to raise the bar with that self-respect without it being uh, narcissistic. You know what I'm saying? There's definitely got to be a balance. And, uh, and, and, and beware, if you're listening, whether here or on the recording, beware of narcissism. People, even believers, can be very narcissistic and very, very self Center, the world revolves around me. So that also can be a, a deception. Uh, so another issue that uh, Moses brings up in Leviticus 24 is, and, and again, the theme is on holiness and not touching death here. Not touching death. Justice and injustice. Weights, balances, scales. Leviticus 24, 17. Anyone who takes the life of a human being is to be put to death. Anyone who takes the life of someone's animal must make restitution, life for life. Anyone who injures their neighbor is to be injured in the same manner. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. The one who has inflicted the injury must suffer the same injury. Whoever kills an animal must make restitution. Whoever kills a human being is to be put to death. You are to have the same law for the foreigner and the native born, I am the Lord your God. So on the issue of holiness, that's the theme. 
and on the issue of being careful not to come in touch with the death. Wow, this is a huge topic. And I mentioned this last week on holiness. Pretty much everything in our life, it's all about balances and scales. How much should I eat? How much I shouldn't eat? How much exercise? How much not? How much time I should de dedicate to this? How much I shouldn't? It's all about balances and scales. Uh, you know, Paul says in, in Philippians 4, don't worry about anything. Obviously, people won't. But instead, with everything, prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. It's like a scale. And, and our, our negative thoughts can weigh us down like a scale. But to balance the scales, prayer, supplication with thanksgiving. The book of Proverbs is all about scales. You know, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. It's okay to have understanding, but just don't lean too much on that understanding. All Pretty much all the Proverbs, it's one thing, one side, and then the balance and the scales. But the, the reason why I'm bringing this up, because number one, it's in our text. And number two uh, is because this can help us in the walk of holiness. When we learn more and more in our, in, with the wisdom of God to balance everything that we're churning over, that we're weighing over. You know, sometimes we think too much. And before we know it, we realize, you know what? I'm feeding on the tree of knowledge. What is feeding on the tree of knowledge, everyone? It's wanting to know the future. It's wanting to know what's around the corner. That's why in our text, Moses says, don't go to soothsayers. Don't go to palm, palm readers. They all tell you your future. Why do people go to these people? They want to know the future. They want to be in control. God is saying, no, no. You feed on the tree of life. That's trusting in me and it will bring you life. But before we know it, if we're feeding on the wrong tree, it's death. We realize, you know what? I'm feeding on the wrong tree. I'm so out of balance. I got to get my peace back. I got to spend time with the Lord. I got to go back, have some quiet time. I got to build that altar that has been broken down, that time that I spend before the Lord. So, and, 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 an, and an issue that we can really struggle with is justice and injustice. Because that's what we're dealing with here. Uh, if someone's animal uh, gets put to death, restitution. And this is a big, big topic. We don't have time to go into it, but justice and injustice. You and I are dealing with just and unjust issues, especially when it's with other people. And it can drive us crazy, especially when we feel we are being treated unjustly. Or what about the war here in Israel? You want to talk about both sides, uh, you know, have got their cases, they've got their points, they've got their arguments. We're being called back to the hard, to the International Court of Justice, where we're put on trial again. South Africa are taking us back. Thank you very much, Francis. <laughs> I know it's not you, it's your government. And uh, and now uh, Egypt, Egypt are doing the same. We helped Egypt get rid of the Islamic jihad, jihad and now they're not helping us deal with Hamas. Talk about a feeling of injustice. But guys, this is something that if you're wrestling with something, maybe a, a work-related incident where someone screwed you over, ripped you off or taken you to court or you need to take these can be they can eat you to the core and all i would just say is don't make a justice a god i don't know if you've heard that term before some people make it a god where they will do anything and everything they can to bring about just look this side of heaven there are some things we will never get a sense of justice. And, and even so, some things we need to just hand over to the Lord. And of course, this can open up, this topic can open up the door for forgiveness as well. And by forgiving that person, it doesn't mean that we're saying that it's okay. What we're doing is we're handing that person over to God. 
we're forgiving them. And something that I'm learning more and more, forgiveness, the main issue of forgiveness is actually it's for you. It's not for that person. It's actually for you. Something to think about. So then the, t the issues of times and seasons. In Leviticus 23, 1, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, these are my appointed festivals and appointed feasts of the Lord, which you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies. Once again, going back to the theme of holiness, the issue of times and seasons as part of our walk of holiness, reaching a higher level of spirituality, we've got to know the times and seasons. Paul dealt with this in the New Testament. Solomon dealt with this in the book of Ecclesiastes by saying there is a time and a season in, for everything under heaven. You and I need to discern what season we're in. Now, here in Israel, it's pretty obvious where, where Solomon says there's a time for war. Now, if it's a time for war and if it's ordained, because remember, it says there's a time and a purpose for everything under heaven. Key phrase. If you're looking at everything under heaven, even if it's done by evil people, what does it mean under heaven? It means you're placing yourself under the sovereignty of God and you're trusting him for everything that happens in your life. So, for example, right now, no work, no tourism. And of course, it's because of the war, but I've just got to say, and I, and I could wrestle with that and lose my peace and it leads to death. Or I can come back, weigh the scales and okay, God, you know that this is going to, you know, your word says there's a time for war. That's what's happening. So I rest in that. I trust you in that. And see, this is the, the, the concept of God gave appointed times and seasons for festivals, for the Sabbath. for the, and, and by the way, next week I'm going to uh, give a little bit of teaching on the Sabbath because I found something. You know, I've been a believer for about, I don't know, many years now. And everyone, especially in Judaism, talks so much about the Sabbath and the Sabbath. And I, I you know, I've got some insights here and insights there. But... I know deep down there's so much more to tap into, but I, I just don't. But I found some pearls that I think I've been waiting for for years, and I want to share that with you next year, next week. Uh, it's just one incredible aspect that will help us all to understand Shabbat. But God doesn't just say there's a, there's times and seasons for no reason. Remember, it's for Him and it's for us, and it's for our uh, our um, not only our sanctification, it's for our transformation. So I won't say any more about that except to say we need to discern what are the times and seasons we're into. Do you know one of the things that says in, in Ecclesiastes 3, there's a time to be built up. There's even a time to be broke, to, to break down. Some people, as we as believers, when God begins to touch on a particular area in our lives that's not right or that's been built on the wrong foundation, do you know what he does? He puts us through a breakdown. We actually go through an emotional breakdown to a degree because we have to get disattached from that particular thing. I'll give you an example. An unhealthy relationship you've had with someone and all of a sudden you realize, you know what, that person's using me. That person is not good for my life. So you have to you have to emotionally detach from that person. And so part of it is you can go through agreement. You can it's like a breakdown. Or let's say you lose a loved uh, brother, sister, spouse, parent, and you're grieving. It's like a break, you're breaking down emotions because you'll lose you've lost someone. Uh, or even a health issue, part of your body. Is not functioning, so there's a time even to be to to be broken down, but then there's a time to be built up, a time for mourning, a time for weeping, a time for joy, a time for that. 
discerning what are, what are the seeds. And this will help in our holiness, our walk of holiness. And it will protect us from death. It will protect us from a waste of emotional and mental energy by thinking too much and, and fighting against the season that we're ordained to be under, under heaven. Uh, we, we, we lose our balance and we're, 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 it, it exhausts us. So uh, let me come to the end by uh, uh, saying um, that there is, uh, by reading, oh, here it is on the last page, there is a time for everything and a season for everything under the heavens. A time to be born, a time to die. A time to plant, a time to uproot. People that want to move, that feel they need to move, a time to uproot, that's hard. A time to heal, a time to kill, a time to heal. A time to tear down, a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones, a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. That's an important one. A time to uh, be silent and a time to speak. When you have to approach someone on an issue, they've, been, they've said something upsetting and you know you need to approach that person, that's a tough one. And you need to really wrestle with that and know when is the right time, what is the right thing to say. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war, a time for peace. What do workers gain from their toil? I have seen a burden that God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has set eternity in the human heart. Yet no man can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Don't forget the other side of Ecclesiastes. If it's not under heaven, what is it? It's chasing after the wind. In Hebrew, chebel chavali. It's meaningless, meaningless. So where, where are we looking at our walk, at our life? Are we looking at it from under heaven? If so, the walk is to climb the ladder of holiness and let us be like the priests who protect ourselves from anything and everything that is causing death. Even some things that used to cause life in our lives, but now they're causing death. And I gave an example of a piece of chocolate cake. You know, it's it starts off, it's good, but then we cross the line and it's like too much. So uh, these priests were descendants of Aaron and his son, so we, so we, as the body of the Messiah, our Aaron is our great high priest, Yeshua. We are his offspring. We are his sons and daughters. He's not ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters. We are his ministers. We are to be followers of him. That his example may teach others to imitate the Savior. Without blemish, he was without blemish, separate from sinners, and yet he sat in fellowship with them. He executed his priestly office on earth. We are his spiritual priests. The minister especially is called to set a good example that people may follow it. And lastly, everyone, remember, when the sacrifices were made, the priests were told to take the ashes, the ashes, outside of the camp are there any things in your life and my life the ashes are the memory right the memory of that deceased thing or person we got to get rid of it we got to take it outside of the camp amen thank you thank you aharon that was excellent after everybody else shares i have a question for you on something you had mentioned in the beginning uh, of your study, so. Okay. Hey, Aaron, when's the last time you heard Dee Dee say, Aaron, that was a terrible teaching. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> he hasn't had one yet. Unbelie <laughs> unbelievable. All those jokes. You need to keep your day job. 
<laughs> well, she speaks life. She speaks life. <laughs> yes, she does. So, it's all good. All good. Uh, oh, wow. Aaron, this is Olivia. I was just going to say, when you were talking about the defecating example, sorry to bring it up, but I had to, It it's amazing the excuses we'll make coming before God, trying to reconcile holiness in our lives, but yet coming before him. I feel like that's an excuse I would have made at one point as far as maybe um, a lack of self-respect or not take, I mean, I've heard this in other people's lives, so I know that's not unique to me, but it, it, it does sound like a big excuse, which kind of shares with me what I, I forget who the people group you were talking about, who did that, but Canaanites. the Canaanites, um, how that was a false God. They didn't really have whatever they did not have. That was a false God. So it was kind of a, a false act. But we can do that in our lives, interestingly enough. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, I think if we're really all honest, um, yeah, I'm sure we all have days like that where we, you know, we come before the Lord. Um, and, uh, um, you know, on one hand, and remember, there are outer courts, there are holy places. And there's the Holy of Holy. Remember, we can come with unkempt hair in the outer court. So he does accept us there. But the question is, is do we want to come in closer? Do we want to climb the ladder? Do we want to walk? And that's what I started off. You know, how much do we want? You know, God will still love us no matter what, but how much higher? How much do we want to protect ourselves from death? Um and, and, and that issue of discipline um, and and uh, and understanding this whole walk of ours. So it's it, really it's in our hands. Um, uh, and, and I think I think if to use an example, it's almost like the Sabbath and the, the, the festivals of the Lord. The Lord invites us to come to these feasts. He invites us to uh, to uh, honor the Sabbath. What happens if we don't? He still loves us. He doesn't love us anything less. He doesn't send a bolt of lightning. The way I see it is we miss out on the blessing. We miss out on the celebration. We miss out on the joy. And we miss out on that communion through it with the Lord. So, uh, you know, and I think it's it can be similar. If we can we can stay at the same level where we're at, and probably make it into heaven. Uh, but I think we're going to miss out on a lot if we don't read our Bibles and and study the deeper things of the Lord. We miss out on so much, um, and probably, you know, we we don't have that place every day where we're sitting under our own vine and under our own fig tree with that peace that the Lord gives us. So, mm. I mean, these are just illustrations of, I think, what you're trying to uh, probably say. Yeah. Thank Good. you, Olivia. Thank you for bringing up uh, defecation. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> Something we'll never forget, I'm sure. <laughs> So I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Who was that? I think you were just echoing. Oh, okay. Wonder why. Okay. So I have a question for you. I've been, um, as you know, visiting this conservative synagogue, take some classes and learn. And I noticed in their newsletter, they have a mitzvah project for the LGBTQ saves project. So I kind of suspected there were a couple of young ladies that, you know, kind of uh, fit into this group. And so it really just bothered me because this subject has always bothered me, even before my eldest daughter declared she was part of this group. But um, so I looked it up on Kabad 
And I was trying to see what, how, how I don't understand their thinking, right? So um, they said something to the effect that, well, we don't like disown people or kick people out because they don't uh, do the Sabbath or this or that. And that, you know, I understood their position and all of that. But then again, they don't have like support groups for people, <laughs> Sabbath breakers and, you know, all of that. So I was just wondering from your viewpoint there in Israel and being Jewish, how do they support this whole lifestyle? Because, you know, as Christians, we don't support, we love the person, but we don't support that lifestyle. So how do they do that? I mean, why are they so supportive? How do the Chabad support? Well, them? the Jewish people, because this is a conservative. Because Jews are know. liberal. Jews are mostly okay. liberal. Yeah, Gary's Gary's hit the nail on the head. I've I've mentioned a number of times. There's so many, you know this, there's so many different kinds of Jewish people. Mm -hmm. Just like, just like there are LGBT churches these days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, you know, liberal Jews, uh, I I know uh, uh lesbian rabbis, female lesbian yeah. rabbis. Me too. Um, yeah. But how would you, why would you worry about getting the matzah out of your house and not be concerned about this? Like, it just doesn't make sense to me. Because, because some, and this is what I had this talk with yesterday with this lawyer as well. Um, some people's Judaism is simply on a social level. You know, I like the candles on the Sabbath. I'm Jewish. That's, that's the, the level of their practicing Judaism. I light the candles uh, for, for, for the Sabbath. Um, I don't eat pork. That's, I'm Jewish, I don't eat pork, but the rest of the day, the rest of the year, I do whatever I want. So it really depends on what Jew, what kind of Jewish person he or she uh, is. Just like Christians. I know a, a pastor of a Calvary Chapel church. He's actually a Messianic Jew, a good friend. His son, I won't name names, his son is living a gay lifestyle, but he told me this. He said he's going to one of these LGBT Christian churches. He is lead, he's one of the worship leaders in this church, and he sings songs about the blood of Jesus. So go figure that one. <laughs> go figure. And he says, you know, I, my hope is that one day while he's playing, the Holy Spirit will just open his eyes and, and bring him back to reality. Yeah. Obviously, you know, there's, there's, they're not quite in reality there. Mm -hmm. And of course, this could open up the door. Are they saved or not? Should we go there today or not? No, that's not. <laughs> well, that would be none of our business now, would it? <laughs> hey, Aaron, this lawyer friend of yours, his name is not Kellen Myers, is it? Please don't tell me it's Kellen. No, 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 it's not. Okay, good, good. Well, no, he's a Calvary Church pastor in the States. Oh, yeah. Okay. I just want to say. Oops. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Who's that? Go ahead, Gary. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I'm going. I'm going back to the study where I, I, I had never had learned or even thought about that the sacrifice that they were giving when they sacrificed the animal that they it was. A meal to to the Lord. It was the Lord's meal, and it it just made sense to me. I don't know that I read Leviticus twenty. I know I read Leviticus twenty one, but never put that together. So that that was. I'm still kind of you know chewing on it, you know, mulling it over about how that all fits together with. Jesus being the bread of life, because King James says to offer the bread of his God. And uh, so that whole correlation and connection. 
I love that. Yeah. yeah. It, it's an amazing study. I think it's in Galatians or somewhere. He talks about how his life is as an, uh, 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 a drink offering. He uses yeah. that term for his life as a drink offering. So, um, yeah, uh, the uh, Jacob poured out a, a, a drink offering to the Lord, an oil offering. It's pleasing to God. Um, it's like, but the, this is what's called biblical imagery. These are just human terms uh, of of ways of expressing how we touch God's heart, how we uh, we we please God, um, and at the same time, um, it's a blessing. The blessing comes back uh, on us if we know that we're really, you know, touching the heart of God. But but one has to be careful with this because I don't want to. I hate I hate the uh, idea of preaching a, a life of, you know, work salvation. This is not about yeah. work salvation, I, yeah. and that's why I, I emphasize. We've got to come to that place where we are just so loved by God, no matter what we do. We're his children. We're loved. Um, but, uh, of course, like our own children, you know, we love our kids to pieces. But sometimes we're frustrated with them. Sometimes we're angry with them. But it doesn't take away that love. Sometimes when they do things, we they touch our heart when they do things for us. They really touch our heart. And so if we can use those uh, illustrations as well, I don't know. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, so Francis promised to move from South Africa to Texas. So, Dee Dee, you need to get your extra bed ready, girl. <laughs> You're on mute, Dee Dee. <laughs> I wouldn't suggest that, but... <laughs> No, Texas is okay. Yeah, it's okay. I was telling Gary I might get arrested for joining an anti-Hamas protest. So <laughs> I hope you have <laughs> money for bail. <laughs> How is the situation in South Africa, Francis? Uh, we have elections coming up on the 29th of May. And then we'll have to see what happens. Um, a lot of people are praying, but we don't have any unrest or anything going on. So we're just holding our breath and hoping that our government, uh, the current government will fall and that we will have a better government taking over as soon as the new term begins. Amen. Mm. Yeah, Francis, we pray the same thing in America. <laughs> It will get a new, a new government, sure. a better with government. Yeah, thank you. It's a good point. Amen, Neil. Yeah, exactly. Not easy days for any of us. Um, yeah. Well, if there's no other comments, Gary, do you want to um, anything to share? Anything to add? You're on. Yes, I, I have. Uh, I know I have three. I usually have three minutes to share. I want to take my three minutes to play this for you because this is perfect for your teaching that you that you mentioned, uh, Aaron. Of of all my thirty one thousand favorite songs, this one's my favorite. So I'm just going <laughs> to listen to it because uh, it's. I love this song. You ready? Yeah. <laughs> I know what that is. Turn, turn, turn. Yes. Turn, turn. Hey, Amen. Amen. It's kind of going in and out, Gary. Okay. It's not very good, but uh, yeah, good song. Good song. Thank you. That song was the sound of silence for me. <laughs> mm. I didn't hear anything. Yeah, it, it went in and out there. Okay, so, by a British girl? Anyway, you, you got them. You got them. It's by the birds. Yeah, the, the birds. birds. Yeah. It's, it's one of my favorite songs. It's, it is it is a, a wonderful song. song. Yeah. So Love praise it. the Lord. 
Thank you, Gary. Thank you. I think we heard enough to get it in our, our minds. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> so, um, Didi, uh, I'll close off in a word of prayer, and then, Gary, you can uh, bless us all. Father God, we thank you for your word and the enlightenment that it brings us and the transformation, Lord, as we not only listen, but as we put it into practice. And I pray that you'd help mm -hmm. us to do that that we would uh, see our lives as a life of, um, of being called to be priests and being called back into, like Adam and Eve, to be called back into that space, that uh, tree of life, that, whole, that garden of Eden, that paradise, that, uh, which is like the, the, the holy of holies, and that uh, our, uh, our walk is, uh, is, is a walk of, uh, being called into that holy place. And um, Lord, thank you that you give us the freedom of choice to do that. And we pray, as Moses said, I set before you uh, blessing and cursing, life and death, choose life. It's, our, it's all our choice. So help us to choose the right thing. Give us wisdom, we pray. Uh, give us um the strength of will to make the right decisions. Help us to see the danger signs, the things that cause us death, uh, the lack of self-respect, the lack of respect for you and others, uh, our time, uh, what we do with our time, our time uh, um, management that actually may be causing us problems in our life, our money, our relationships, every aspect of our lives, Lord. We pray for wisdom. As we walk this walk of life, thank you that you do accept us just as we are, but also, Lord, that uh, you do set a standard of holiness. And we thank you for that because you are holy, Lord. We want to walk and be holy as well. So uh, 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 give us the grace, we pray. Amen. 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 If you don't, if you don't please unmute your... Unmute and receive the blessing of the Lord. It's called the Burkhat Kohanim, the priestly blessing. And if you can if you can do your fingers like this, that means you're Jewish. <laughs> the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his hands upon each and every one of you and fill it overflowing with his peace, with his shalom. B'shem Adonai Yeshua HaMashiach. In the name of our Lord, Jesus the Messiah. Adonai our Lord. Moshienu our Redeemer. Pelio its wonderful counselor. El Gibor, mighty God. Aviad, everlasting Father. Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace. Adonai Rafe, the God who heals, restores, and makes whole. Ari Yehuda, the Lion of the Tribe of Judah, and of course, our El Shaddai, our all-sufficient God. And all of God's people says, Amen. 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 Amen.